The fun thing about neuromuscular diseases is that most of the time, you can make a diagnosis clinically. Even in patients who I meet at the hospital who have a stroke, I need at least a head CT. And after that, I can often make an educated guess as to whether the hemorrhage was hypertensive, or if it was traumatic, or due to some underlying coagulopathy. Or if it's a stroke, whether the stroke is due to small vessel ischemic disease, or if it's embolic from some proximal atherosclerotic source. But after that, I need more diagnostic testing. If a patient comes in with weakness of the hand, it's not all that difficult to get a good sense as to whether the weakness is due to a brain problem, or a spine problem, or a root or nerve problem. And if it's a root or nerve problem, which root? Which nerve? Welcome back to another installment of Brainwaves, a podcast about neurology and medicine, and all the fascinating science and history that come with it. In this week's Teaching Through Clinical Cases, we'll be discussing the case of a patient with hand weakness and reviewing the pertinent neuroanatomy and physiology that you need to know to make the clinical diagnosis. I'm your host, Jim Siegler. Stay with us. I'm joined in the studio this week by one of my awesome yeah, senior residents at Cooper, Dr. Akriti Kotiwal. Whatever you want to say. All right. My name is Akriti Kotiwal. I'm a senior neurology resident at Cooper University Hospital, and I'm interested in neuromuscular medicine. Akriti is currently undifferentiated in her neurologic subspecialty, but she has a particular interest in neuromuscular disease. Cool. Thanks for coming, Akriti. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, so you have a case. I do have a case. So, the patient's chief complaint is right hand weakness and paresthesias. So, let me stop you right there, and this is why I love starting with the chief complaint. So, what is the reason that the patient's seeking our clinical attention? It may seem like a silly question, but I think you can easily get very overwhelmed by all kinds of extraneous information, irrelevant family and medical history in the first line, and this can be distracting and maybe you know even overwhelming to students and residents when they present. So I like to hear the chief complaint first because it helps me filter out or it helps me focus on some of the salient historical details. Once I've heard that you said this patient has hand weakness, then I'm immediately starting to localize the lesion. Is it a problem of the primary motor cortex, the corona radiata? We're kind of descending down this corticospinal pathway. Some problem with the posterior limb of the internal capsule, ventral, lateral, or ventral anterior thalamic nuclei, the cerebral peduncle, the pons, the pyramids. And then in the spine, is it the lateral corticospinal tract, the anterior horn, the root, the plexus, nerve, junction, muscles? Where is the lesion? Once I've visualized this pathway, now I'm ready for more clues as to where this lesion may localize. So now I can hear more about the case. All right. So this patient is a 49-year-old woman with non-insulin-dependent diabetes and headaches who has felt an achy discomfort in her right hand for several years. It hasn't really bothered her until the last few months, when now it's becoming more irritating. She's taken ibuprofen and acetaminophen without much improvement. The pain affects most of the palm and travels up the wrist and forearm. There is no neck involvement. In addition to the discomfort, she's also having trouble using her right hand. Specifically, she's had trouble opening jars and stitching, which used to be a hobby of hers. She hasn't noticed any difficulty combing her hair or brushing her teeth. No trouble ambulating, getting up and down stairs, and no other focal areas of weakness. Excellent. I want to highlight some of the things that you just mentioned. So lack of neck involvement is major. And while it doesn't rule out a cervical radiculopathy or a myelopathy, some canal stenosis, I'm less concerned about it being a cord or a root process. The fact that she has some functional deficits, difficulty opening jars and stitching, those are all functions of our intrinsic hand muscles and our forearms. Things like buttoning shirts or holding a book would be difficult, something like turning pages. Whereas if her proximal muscles were weak, I would imagine that she'd have difficulty bringing her arm over her head, combing her hair, brushing her teeth. Symptoms that you see in patients who have proximal myopathies, inclusion body myositis, polymyositis, FSHD, and that kind of thing. Then the lack of other focal deficits that you mentioned, no other focal areas of weakness or numbness, that makes a central cause of weakness much less likely. So at this point then, we're thinking the lesion is most likely a peripheral lesion. Right. There doesn't seem to be any other kind of central process or something affecting the neck, the cord, or something supratentorially. So something at the level of the muscle or the nerve. 
And in someone her age, I think a myopathy would be unlikely. There are some rare distal predominant myopathic disorders, which can affect the intrinsic muscles of the hands, but they're typically symmetric. And a family history should be helpful here as many of these conditions are autosomal dominant. So she doesn't have any known family history to my knowledge at this point. Neuromuscular junction disease is possible, but it's highly unlikely as myasthenia gravis typically affects the proximal upper extremities and the bulbar muscles, sometimes just the eye muscles. Lambert-Eden is also a disorder that affects the proximal muscles. It kind of looks more like a myopathy than myasthenia does, and it affects predominantly the lower extremities. A nerve process sounds much more probable in this situation, given she has positive phenomena of paresthesias and the kind of distribution of her symptoms to the isolated hand muscles. For the most part, I'm thinking about compression of the median nerve at the carpal tunnel, your classic carpal tunnel syndrome. So next, I would ask some more specific questions kind of targeting this diagnosis. Does the patient have paresthesias more commonly at night? Are they provoked by certain maneuvers, typing on a keyboard, driving a car, something where you're compressing the nerve in the carpal tunnel? The patient could also have an ulnar neuropathy, as in some patients who ride a bicycle or manipulate their hands in other ways, something provoked by an occupation. So let's get more of a history and then we can move on to the exam. All right. So when asked, she said her wrist pain is most bothersome upon waking and sometimes she will wake up with the pain. She's an Uber driver, doesn't bike, doesn't use a lot of hand tools in her line of work. She's a non-smoker, no other relevant social history, no family members with nerve or muscle disease. Besides the acetaminophen, she takes no other daily medications. On exam, her vital signs are within normal limits. Her mental status and cranial nerves are completely intact. No evidence of a facial palsy or other motor or sensory findings above the neck. Her motor exam is notable for normal power in the left upper extremity and bilateral lower extremities. In the right arm, shoulder abduction, elbow flexion and extension, and wrist flexion and extension are 5 out of 5. In the hand, she has 4 out of 5 strength with thumb abduction in the plane of the palm, the abductor pollicis brevis, and with thumb opposition, which is the opponent's pollicis muscles. Finger extension and thumb extension are all intact. Her sensory exam is remarkable for no sensory level of the upper cervical spine, normal sensation of the right upper arm and forearm, and reduced sensation to pinprick of the first three digits and the medial aspect of the fourth digit. Reflexes are grossly intact. Now, one thing I want to focus on here is that the sensory exam can be very telling, but a lot of patients have sensory complaints that are often nonspecific, and they're not the most objective of findings. So I do want to focus a little bit more on the motor exam. What I'm hearing is that there's isolated muscle weakness of two different groups, the abductor pollicis brevis and the opponent's pollicis, with a tactile sensory loss of the thumb, the index, the middle, and part of the ring finger. And that's a great story for carpal tunnel syndrome, a median neuropathy at the wrist. And the odds are that this is actually what it's going to be. We have the right demographic. Women and patients with diabetes are at increased risk of this carpal tunnel syndrome. We have a classic risk factor, compression from steering wheel use as she's an Uber driver. And we have a nice temporal evolution of the paresthesias and later weakness that progresses over several years without much significant disability. And we have no other exam findings to suggest there's an alternative localization to the lesion. But let's at least entertain some other diagnostic possibilities. Again, returning to our localization schema. Could there be a lesion of the brain? Yeah, I mean, possibly. We've seen patients with cortical infarcts of the hand knob. It's a cortical structure that is injured in isolation of any other kind of focal weakness or numbness of the legs or the face. There was a time when I was a resident that I saw a patient who had a massive frontotemporal meningioma that was compressing the hand knob, and her only presenting symptom was she had difficulty texting on her iPhone. Moving down the brain, considering the descending corticospinal tract, it would be unlikely that the lesion in this dense white matter highway would result in an isolated weakness or numbness of the hand. But stranger things have happened. Back in 2017, one of my co-residents and I, we wrote up the case of an older woman who presented with what kind of seemed like carpal tunnel syndrome, a compressive neuropathy at the wrist, um, and also a peripheral neuropathy at the ankle with sudden paresthesias, but she ended up actually having an infarct of the medial lemniscus. Less likely, though, for our current patient who has kind of progression of her symptoms. Next, could she have a root process, a cervical radiculopathy? This is very common, too, and it's something you have to think about. Paresthesias that overlie the thumb and the first fingers could be due to a C6 or a C7 radiculopathy, 
but you might expect more neck findings, pain with lateral neck movement, which is spurling test, where you rotate the head toward the affected side and you push the head down toward the shoulder. So imagine that as you're pushing the head in the direction of the neural frame and you're compressing the nerves that are exiting through that root, this might reproduce those symptoms of paresthesias. You might also see other evidence of C6 or C7 root dysfunction. So they may have blunted biceps or triceps reflexes with that C6 radiculopathy. Or if it's C7, you might see reduced brachioradialis reflex. There should also be weakened deltoid and biceps with C6 involvement, or weakened triceps with C7 root. In this case, we don't seem to have any of those muscles that are weak or any differences in reflexes. It's really only the isolated intrinsic muscles of the hand. So what else do you got? So there were no other long track signs to suggest a brain or spinal lesion. With head rotation and neck flexion, symptoms could not be provoked. Her deltoid and biceps muscles were symmetric with normal triceps, biceps, and brachioradialis reflexes. So next I would ask, could this all be a C8 radiculopathy, which is a root that innervates most of the intrinsic muscles of the hand, along with the T1 root? So this becomes a common branch point in your differential diagnosis of hand weakness and tingling, and you can distinguish a C8 radiculopathy by the sensory pattern that should only involve the medial two digits. But the sensory exam, like I said before, is very subjective. Alternatively, you might test multiple muscles that are supplied by the C8 root, but different peripheral nerves. This way you can distinguish C8 from a median or C8 from an ulnar neuropathy. For example, checking abduction of the index finger by testing the first dorsal interosseus or the abductor digiti minimi, which are ulnar nerve innervated muscles, these should be spared if the patient has carpal tunnel. If those muscles are also weak, in addition to the APB and the opponent's pollicis, then there must be a common source of the weakness, medial cord, lower trunk, or a C8 or T1 root. More commonly though, this would be a C8 or T1 root. So, getting back to our patient, there is weakness of the APB and opponent's pollicis, two median nerve innervated muscles. To distinguish median nerve from anything more proximal, we can test the abduction of the index finger, FDIO, which is innervated by the ulnar nerve, suggesting a C8 root process, or less commonly, lower trunk medial cord. But how do you know if the median neuropathy is at the carpal tunnel or somewhere more proximal? That's a great question, and the odds are it's going to be at the level of the carpal tunnel. But if you make that assumption and you forego other diagnostic testing or closer clinical examination, you may end up surgically releasing the carpal tunnel and not actually fixing the patient's problem. Carpal tunnel Based on epidemiologic data, we know that it's 100 times more common to have a median neuropathy here than anywhere else in the arm. And you can test for this clinically by using Tonell's test, tapping on the carpal tunnel to elicit symptoms, or some people also check the Phalen's maneuver where you basically hyperflex the wrist, which effectively compresses the tunnel. The reverse Phalen's maneuver has also been described, and you do this by hyperextending the wrist, which also compresses the tunnel. But you're absolutely right that this could be a focal median nerve compression somewhere else in the arm, sometimes the forearm or higher up. More proximally, you can imagine that a compression at the ligament of struthers, and this kind of takes you back to medical school anatomy, the ligament of struthers is this fibrous band that overlies the distal humerus, and compression there will result in loss of function of all median nerve innervated muscles, including the pronator teres. But a ligament of struthers compression is very rare. Only 1-2% to of the population has this ligament to begin with, and it's associated with a bony spur of the humerus. Entrapment more distally to the elbow, at the proximal forearm, is a little bit more common, and median nerve injury here can be due to a hypertrophied pronator teres, the aptly named pronator teres syndrome, usually common in weightlifters, and you can reproduce symptoms of paresthesias here by compressing the pronator teres muscles with your hands, and depending on the location of the entrapment, you may or may not also see pronator weakness as some of those nerve fibers are innervating that hypertrophic muscle. A compression of the anterior interosseous is a little easier to identify clinically. Anterior interosseous neuropathy will spare the intrinsic hand muscles because the AION branches off the median nerve and it supplies only the flexor pollicis longus, the distal thumb flexor, the flexor digitorum profundus, and the pronator quadratus. It's not important to know all of these, but the easiest way to really test for a compression at this site is to have the patient make an OK sign and you try to break it. And if they can't make the okay sign, then you know that the lesion is at least more proximal than the carpal tunnel. 
Importantly, with an anterior interosseous neuropathy, there is no loss of somatosensation. sensation. The AIOIN branch gives off no cutaneous sensory fibers. It does innervate some areas of the wrist joints, but nothing cutaneous. And finally, as you're aware, with compression of the carpal tunnel, you have weakened thenar muscles with the digital sensory loss of the lateral fingers. Now that's a lot to take in, and I don't expect you guys to memorize all that, but the key to each of these circumstances is to distinguish a proximal median neuropathy with involvement of the pronator teres and the flexor carpi radialis from an anterior interosseous neuropathy in which the flexor pollis is longest and the flexor digitorum profundus are weakened, but not the APB or the opponent's pollicis because again, this nerve has branched off of the median. And then also distinguishing these nerves from compression of the recurrent thenar nerve, which innervates the APB and the opponent's pollicis. And this nerve gets compressed at the carpal tunnel. So, let me try to summarize. The proximal median nerve supplies muscles of pronation of the forearm. The anterior interosseous nerve can be tested with distal palm flexion and finger flexion, making the OK sign. And the recurrent thenar nerve can be tested with thumb abduction. Perfect. And interestingly, the palmar cutaneous branch comes off of the proximal median nerve before the carpal tunnel, and this supplies the thenar eminence. So you kind of have this differential loss of tactile sensation overlying the APB when there's no carpal tunnel involvement. But with carpal tunnel syndrome, you should have sparing of that region overlying the APB. Is there a way to clinically distinguish a C8 from a T1 root in a suspected radiculopathy? Unfortunately, it's difficult to isolate muscles that are innervated by the T1 root. However, the extensor indicus proprius, which is one of the intrinsic hand muscles that I always test in isolated hand weakness, it's a radial nerve innervated muscle. This muscle receives fibers only from the C8 root. So if your index finger extension is weak and the setting of other intrinsic hand muscles being weak, then you can feel more confident that it's going to be a C8 radiculopathy as opposed to anything else. Or a brachial plexopathy. Or some complicated brachial plexopathy. But now it's getting a little bit complicated. You would absolutely need an EMG to distinguish some brachial plexus lesion from like a C8 radiculopathy at that point. That's it for our show this week. Clinically, the patient discussed today had a classic case of carpal tunnel syndrome or a compressive median neuropathy at the wrist, and this is a clinical diagnosis. You do not need the EMG. But if you do get the EMG, if a patient shows signs of denervation of the APB or of the opponents, and they are asymptomatic, it does not qualify as carpal tunnel. You need a clinical correlate. For more information on what was discussed, I definitely recommend you check out the Preston and Shapiro text, Electromyography and Neuromuscular Disorders, Clinical Electrophysiologic Correlations. It's a great book, and I reference it all the time in my practice. The Brainwaves Podcast is produced by myself, Jim Siegler, with the help of Akrati Kotiwal. Music for this week's program was courtesy of Jazar, Lee Rosevere, and Loyalty Freak Music under a Creative Commons license. Sound effects by Mike Koenig and Daniel Simeon. I'm Jim Siegler for Brainwaves. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.